good morning or rather good evening for some of our friends and colleagues from all over the world. Good, good morning, good evening everyone and welcome to the Australian National University and the ANU Centre for Arab and Islamic Studies. I'm Karim al and I'm the director of the centre. It's a huge pleasure to welcome you all. I would like to start first by paying our respect to all First Nation Australians. The Australian National University acknowledges, celebrates and pays our respect to the Nunawal and Nambri people of the Canberra region and to all First Nation Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We are genuinely and truly honoured to host yet another Mirror of Iran conference series with our partner, the Association of Iranica and Australasia. Last year, in late, last year in late November, we had a fantastic joint conference uh, with the association on the subject of a continuing legacy of Persian poetry and music. And we had excellent feedback and, and comments. Uh, it was an incredible conference. And this year, we are honored again to co-organize this conference on contemporary Persian literature, fiction, and storytelling. Yet another timely and topical uh, topic. I would like, first of all, to thank Mr. Masoud Roshan, President of the Association of Iranica in Australasia, um, who has put on and invested a lot of effort um, in co-organizing this conference. And I would like to thank equally my esteemed colleague, Dr. Zara Tahiri, um, who is the jewel of our center, a passionate advocate uh, of Persian uh, culture, Persian language, um, and Persian literature and herself an accomplished poet uh, and a, a highly respected scholar in the field. And I would like to thank her sincerely for all the work um, she has been doing and in investing in co-organizing this second excellent conference, which bring together very well-known writers, and I welcome them to this platform, and very well-known scholars um, to discuss Persian uh, literature. I would like also to thank my colleague, Mr. Adam Spence, um, for helping us with the logistics of the conference and the smooth running of the event. Thank you so much, Adam. I will hand over uh, to my colleague, Dr. Zara Tahiri, uh, to speak a bit about the conference. I was hoping that um, Mr. Roshan will join us, but he's been having some technical... Oh, he's here. Oh, Mr. Roshan, it's a delight to have you. Uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, everyone, and I look forward to the discussion and the debate um, throughout the day. Thank you all for your contribution. I hand over to you, Mr. Osha. Thank you very much, and I apologize for technical problem I had to connect. Uh, okay, welcome on behalf of both Association of Iranica and also the Persian Studies section of ANU. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, acknowledge the um, indigenous people, past, present, and future of every land representing here today, and to acknowledge their stories that form the bedrock of what we have today. And interestingly enough, we know that the um, art of storytelling is something of time immemorial. And that's what we owe to our indigenous brothers and sisters around the world. We live in a most unusual time uh, amidst the global pandemic that is creating an enormous pain and difficulty, but at the same time, it has forced us to find new ways of coming together. And we are an example of that today. As we meet from all countries around the world to continue and to share, discuss and learn and to be uplifted. Um, our um, our um, uh, represents here, this year come from all different parts of the globe. We have representations from Europe, from Asia, from North America and Australasia. 
And uh, it has been really a rich experience, uh, especially since last year that we had a very interesting conference again uh, with the collaboration of the Australian National University, uh, which was on the theme of uh, Persian poetry and music. And it was indeed a very memorable occasion because we had some 15 uh, presentations, uh, a lot of them from Iran, uh, an excellent high quality of both um, presentations by the scholars and also the PhD graduates. Um, so uh, basically to give you some idea of uh, these association of ironical activities. Um, the association was established in 2004. And since then, we have been organizing various forums and activities. And the objectives of associations, of course, is um, um, at the disposal of all of you, you know, through our website and, and Facebook. But to give you um, a little bit more information about this series of conferences we had since 2014 onwards, um, uh, starting and giving a nickname of Mirrors of Iran, series of um, conferences which concentrated on different themes and uh, aspects of Iranian civilization, started initially from archaeology and ancient history of Iran, uh, Alamite uh, cultures, very early cultures with collaboration at Sydney University and uh, Macquarie University. And, and also it has expanded further. And each year since then, we had different themes. We covered brilliantly, you know, the Iranian cinema, concentrating on Mahmal Bof. Um, and also the following year after that, we had a theme on literature and some of the women poets throughout the history. Then we had architecture again, which was a very unique um, conference, but these conferences were face to face. So I get back to the point that really this, um, uh, new approach through virtual um, conferences, it has given us better opportunity to uh, invite great scholars um, and uh, be together, you know, uh, through these webinars, which are excellent, really. Um, so I, I don't uh, say any more, and I would officially open the conference and move on straight away to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. Hura Yavari, whom I had the honor of knowing her for, uh, sin the, since the inception of our association, when actually our um, aim and objective was primarily to promote and introduce Encyclopedia Iranica. Um, and Dr. Yavari was always a great supporter in providing us with information for our conferences um, and um, helping us in organizing some of the events we had. So I thank her sincerely for that. And um, Dr. Yavari has got a distinguished background um, in the area of uh, Persian literature. She has been a long-standing assistant editor um, of Encyclopedia Iranica, contributing basically to the Persian fiction, and she has written extensively in both Encyclopedia and other sources and has done extensive research on the uh, novels, Persian uh, stories, and uh, uh, related lit literature. Uh, she also is member of International Iranian Studies Associations, 
and currently she's um, a, re a, re a senior researcher at the Columbia University in the section of Iranian studies. So I can go on with many other uh, credentials that uh, owe to Professor Yavari, and I would welcome her to give our presentation today. I, I should like to begin by thanking first Mr. Roshan for his eloquent language to, to talk about the history of the, 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 these activities and the way that he kindly introduced me. I'm so thankful, Mr. Roshan, and it was a pleasure for me during my years in the Encyclopedia with the Center for Iranian Studies to, to be in touch with these devoted admirers of Persian history, culture, and their interest in the development of a further development of the Encyclopedia Ironica. I would like just to give me as a token of appreci appreciation to the beauty and the elegance of the language that we all love and so many Iranian novelists and poets have used and they have left us so many beautiful work to say just a few words in, in Persian and, and my, actually the words of my tank, if you do not mind, then I will switch again to English for the rest of the... Um, دانشگاه از مرکز مطالعات دانشگاه نشنال یونیورسیتی آف استرالیا و انجمن دوستان انجمن ایرانیکا در استرالیا خیلی واقعا متشکر و سپاسگزار هستم که این فرصت رو به من در اختیار من قرار دادید این توفیق خیلی بزرگی هست برای صحبت کردن در مورد ادبیات داستانی ایران در که اون چیزی که من صحبت خواهم کرد در ظرف این صد سال گذشته است یعنی از شروع قرن چهاردهم شمسی تا امسال خیلی واقعا سپاسگزارم thank you so much Mr. Roshan for your kind words now going back to, to English I'm going to trace the history and development of Persian fiction in the past century. And I'm going to emphasize on Jamal Zadeh's Yeki Wood, Yeki Nabud, a collection of short stories that he published in 1921, which was now again a hundred years ago. Although the, the title of my talk may speak otherwise, but it is my contention that talking of, of, of the history of literary history does not us usually follow a smooth path of, a, of a, a, an evolutionary process. And um, we, we should be on the safer side not to put too much emphasis on any particular individual with regard to the formation of Persian fiction as we see it today. It would be more accurate to think in terms of a new climate of opinion where many voices could express their ideas and demands which would have not been possible or understood half a century ago. So it's better just to think about continuity rather than a rupture. While medieval Persian writers did produce a lot of work in prose, which can be considered as either heroic, romantic, or mystical fiction, modern Persian fiction did not blossom, it seems so, until the, as a genre, of course, as, a, and as an independent genre, after the constitutional revolution. The 19th century Iran 
as we all have noticed, had witnessed dramatic transformation and certain historical events, most notably in education and journalism, had a direct effect on the rise of what we call Persian modern fiction today. And it created its readers, writers, and especially the manner and the matter and its content. The Constitutional Revolution, the introduction of printing technology, the appearance of newspapers and printed books, and the translation movement, which is of high importance, that had begun in mid 19th century, they did a lot. They did much to change the, the, the literary culture from traditional concepts to one underlined by, by modern literary movements. Alongside these landmarks, and partly because of them, there were important changes in the way individuals saw themselves and saw the world. This is a, one of the, this down to earth detailed description of, of daily life of common people, which appeared in Persian, Persian storytelling was a dramatic change in the history and development of, of Persian novels and short stories. In a word, we can say that kings, heroes, rulers, they departed the literary scene, and ordinary people dominated the stage and got the chance of playing their roles in their own lives. Literature in that period addressed the relationship between tradition and modernity, and the political ideas, of course, that entailed by modernity, such as changes in the position of women in society, culture, and literature. In the wake of, of this break from the past, many intellectuals of the period, they developed a sort of critical approach toward the history and culture into which they were born. And they welcomed, they forced upon themselves the task of reinvestigating the very foundation on which their identity and self conception traditionally rested. Their initial encounter with modernity, which was one of the earliest outside the Western Europe, launched them on a cataract of conceptual opposition. It was East versus West, Old versus New regressive versus progressive, traditional versus modern, and so on and so forth. And it was too far from seeing these concepts as, as continuous. They prefer to see them as distinct and, and as a sort of rupture in the history. The of, of such a problematic and conflicted encounter between inherited history and infiltrated culture was widely visible in the lit literary production of this period. So it was more than coincidence that the very early works of fic Persian fiction, what we call it more or less in the, in, in the modern fiction, were historical novels and dramas that, and they were written by intellectuals and political activists that had spent a part of their lives outside Iran, and they contrasted the dire condition of their homeland with what, to their eyes, seemed as progress. And so they could not. They they. Put, con con contrasted this situation together, and the result was that their work or the main objective 
was not that much to produce a fiction a story, but to change and to introduce improvement into the country. Many of, many of these kind of books appear during the years before and after the reconstitution or revolution. It is again very, very interesting to note that the very first historical novelists of the period, they excluded contemporary history from their, lit their literary scene. If we just put aside some few exceptions, history as treated by the first generation of fiction writers was the history of pre-Islamic Iran. It was in such a climate that Jamal Zadeh published his first collection of short stories. It's interesting to note that the year 1921-22, which is the turn of the century in Persian calendar, marked the appearance of three literary books, all remembered as first in their own field. Yeti Bud, Yeti Nabud by Jamal Zadeh, a collection of poetry, or actually two collections of poetry in less than two years by Nima Yushi, Qesse Rang Paride, Khun Sar, Va Afsane, and a play called Jafar Khan as Farangamade by Hassan Mogaddam. These three, the three of them were pioneer works and a turning point in the Persian prose in the history of Persian prose, Persian poetry, and Persian drama. So if we take the encounter of tradition and modernity as the main question of that period, the title that Jamal Zadeh has chosen for her, his collection, Yeki Bud, Yeki Nabud, appears a very telling one. As we know, this, this phrase or this sentence appears at the beginning of most this, this folkloric tales, the Sahaya Irani, they almost all start with Yeki Bud, Yeki Nabu. And Jamal Zadeh, by choosing their title, this title, replicates the, that traditional opening of, of those traditional tales. The collection, as we know, con had, it, uh, contained a uh, an introduction with Jamal Zadeh called Divache, and six stories. And at the end of it comes a glossary of words that he um, later expanded and published uh, in a book. It was called um, the Persian, no, the Farhangi Logata Amiyane. It was later published, expanded and published. Many critics that have written on the role of Jamal Zadeh and uh, this collection of his stories, they just somehow agree that the, the Jamal Zadeh's introduction to the collection is the literary manifesto for the modernist Persian prose writing. In this introduction, Jamal Zadeh, more than anything else, laments that forceful grip of high bro literature and its arcane vocabulary and complex sentence structure on, on Persian language prose. He calls on Persian writers to celebrate the potentials, the democratic potentials and power of the vernacular. And it is his contention that literary democracy paved the way 
for social democracy if properly employed and followed. Jamalzadeh's debauchee is very significant in the, if we go for the analysis of the processes through which 20th century Persian literature has responded to the challenges of modern fiction writing in the West. Unfortunately, there is no time to go to, to talk even a little, even briefly, on the six stories of, of the collection, but I'm going to limit myself to the first story of the collection, which the title is for C. Shekaras, Persian is sweet, because it's more relevant, is of, of more importance to the topic of our conversation tonight or today. Farsi Shekaras is the first person narrative, and there is a Persian guy who has arrived his country after spending several times abroad, and for the reasons that he has the slightest idea about, is detained as in, as, as in a cellmate with three more people. One of them is a traditional mullah, the other one is a farangi mob or a pseudo westernized, and the other one is called Ramazan, and Ramazan is the common man that like the narrator himself, does not know why he is in the prison. So what Ramazan does, goes to the traditional mullah and asks him, do you know why I'm here? The way that he responds to his uh, question and the language that he uses, the language is so flooded with Arabic terms and expressions that Ramazan does not understand the word of it. So he goes to the to, to Farangi Mob and finds it even more difficult to understand what he said. Farangi Mob's language is heavily sprinkled with French expression and words that he has somehow not properly translated into, into Persian and the accent and the, so he does not understand anything. So if we put all these, these, four, four, these figures together, we will see that Jamal Zadeh has introduced us, instead of characters, three social types. And the, these three social types actually represent the society and the time that Jamal Zadeh tries to capture and bring it to the background of his writings, which is our encounter with the modernity. And Jamal Zadeh himself, it is interesting to know that is the prototype of that person that has left Iran at the age of 16, and he has never found easy to live for a long time again back in Iran. So this kind of problem of adjusting for the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the situation that you have left, you have changed, but the situation has not changed, the society has not changed, appears as a kind of theme in many of his stories and, and novels that he writes after 10, 15 years after that. But now, if we look at the Persian fiction throughout this century, the, the, the last century, we see that after the publication of Jamal Zadeh's Yakibud Yakinarud, Persian fiction has gone a long way. 
Then after 113, after 1300, historical novels that appeared after the publication of Jamal Zadeh's work remained also a strong genre during the first half of the of the 20th century, and their aim was to bring to life a distant past. Like, like the fiction, like the historical writers before, they did not let the contemporary his history to step into the domain of their works. Distant past, either real or imagined, was, a, was the background of most of these stories. And they convey a, a curious blend of nostalgia and factual information about the past. The idealized pre-Islamic Persia was part of that this process, nostalgic process, and assumed a very significant role that was like, like something shimmering in the far horizon. It was in line with these uh, theological studies of the 18th and 19th century, and the Bay was based on the Orientalist enterprises of the 19th century. And the, so the intellectual elites of the period were engaged in that discourse of, um, it was a discourse of center, the discourse of, uh, and, uh, of I and other. And like all these similar tales, it was shaped by principles of exclusion, not inclusion. Many layers of the society, many parts of the history were excluded from their narrative. Along with this, these historical novels, or the novelists who took refuge in the distant past, there were other novelists who expressed their discontent by criticizing social conditions. In most of these novels, they also contrasted the innocent rural girl with the urban woman that they did not like. The city and the village were also contrasted and it took, it took Persian novel several more decades to get out of this, this, this very closed atmosphere of of, of excluding, ex exclusion and get being out and be, be blamed for, the, for responding to the trends of modernity. It, was, it took quite a long time for Persian women to get out of that and now and, and produce their own works that we, we, as we can say, and bibliographies show now uh, the Persian, uh, the women, the female Persian writers, we cannot talk about them as a part of Persian literature now, but they are as noticeable, as admirable as the rest of the novelists, regardless of the, their gender are. We can sure say today that Persian fiction in these 100 years has gone a long way 
has passed through many untraveled roads and has undergone numerous changes that have altered its form, its function, and its place as a central in index of Persian literature. Each stage in this process has mani manifested distinct orientations and has followed specific social agendas as several generations of writers, critics, and readers have redirected the resources of the Persian language to guide the literature of their time toward greater engagement with momentous issues of Persian society. The result has been an important body of work that expresses the depth and breadth of human emotions and has enabled Persian speakers to record their experiences and visions in fictional narratives that are at once socially significant and aesthetically satisfying, in contrast to the, to the first examples of, of Persian novel or short, short story that the main function of it was to change the society, not to create a, a narrative, a fictional narrative or a work of a literary work. Now, if, if going back to the question that I, be, I began the talk with, could we trace Jamal Zadeh's footsteps in the works that are produced by the Persian writers in this 100 years? Could we argue that the history of Persian fiction has followed the lines marked by Jamal Zadeh in his introduction to Yekibud Yekinabud? And can we take a further step and talk about Jamal Zadeh's ability to place himself at the center of this historical scrutiny and to integrate his account in the shared narrative of the period's history? Could be such a thing? Could be? I think a quick look at the major themes advocated in the collection and in some other works of Jamal Zadeh could, may shed some light and may offer some answer to this question. In general, we can say that it appears that there is a sharp distinction between the early works of fiction that Jamal Zadeh produced and his later composition. In other words, we can say, or we might be able to say, that Jamal Zadeh has not followed his own footsteps in, in his earlier, in his later works. But there is no question that Jamal with Jamal Zadeh, the language of Persian prose that had experienced a gradual inclination to simplicity at the turn of the century in the works of, of for as, as an example in the works of the Khoda, moves further with Jamal Zadeh in the direction of vernacular speech, the language of the people. In the stories that are collected in this collection, Yekibud Yekinabud, the stories contrary to the conventions of all Persian stories that transpire for the most part in the world and in the public, these stories are marked with a linear narrative and clearly defined spatial and temporal boundaries. From the technical point of view, the, the most of his novels, Jamal Zadeh's novel, lack a firm and continuous narrative that we see in the, in the novels and short stories, stories that were produced later. They are episodic, and in this regard, Jamal Zadeh displayed more talent for short stories than long stories. And in his later works, he grew increasingly intent on abandoning fiction for erudition and advice. 
what is missing in Jamal Zadeh's stories, also noticeable in his longer pieces of work, is the development of the characters. Jamal Zadeh, the, the characters in Jamal Zadeh's stories are closer to familiar social types as, as we talked about. And the, the story follows a linear life. And moreover, Jamal Zadeh frequently intrudes in the, in the fiction and disrupts his natural flow of, of, of narrative. So we mentioned what, we, uh, what I mentioned that in the, in the, in the, the year 1921, Nemo's collection of poetry was published and Jamal Zadeh also published his Yekinabud, one in Berlin and one in Iran. And both Jamal Zadeh and Nima they produced modern, they were, the, they, they were the first in their, their fields, Nima in poetry and Jamal Zadeh in fiction. Now, the question is that if we compare Nima with Jamal Zadeh, can we, can we ask these questions that have these early fellow travelers ended up in the same destination? Have they stayed at the same line that they started? The journey. Nemo's poetry, as we know, transformed the structure, content, language, and the imaginer of Iran's centuries old poetry. It also points to new horizon in portraying nature, time, and history. Numerous Persian poets and numerous Persian-speaking Persian poets in other countries have followed Nima's line of poetry and the trend of his poetry continue, continues till today. Could we say, say the same thing about Jamal Zadeh? It seems that not too many fiction writers have followed Jamal Zadeh's footsteps after him. The absence of character development and the other factors that we, we talked about. And Jamal Zadeh's reluctance to adopt a more innovative approach to literature might explain why, despite his status as the pioneer of modern fiction, he has not found too many followers among the younger generation of writers unlike those who immediately followed him, most notably Sadiq Hedayat and Sadiq Chubak. Western fiction today in Iran and abroad is marked by dynamic exper experimentation with techniques of na narration, choice of plot, imagery, structure and formal sophistication in line with recent tendencies in most modern literature modern Persian fiction expresses the expresses doubt uncertainty anxiety tension paradox and dilemma it tells of beginnings and not of end a century old modern Persian fiction has remained receptive to external influences and follows trends and styles as they appear elsewhere. Stream of consciousness, um, interior monologue being cases in point. From a fictionalized remembrance of the nation's idealist, idealized past to a portrayal of imbalances and injustices and to the depiction of the hardship of war and revolution. Persian fiction has remained a vehicle for change as well as a testament of its 
painful process. In contrast to the clearly defined boundaries of I and other, and well-composed types that we saw in the first samples of Persian novels and short stories, contemporary Persian fiction presents its readers with the interchangeability and the limited boundaries of the fictive characters, which signifies the realization of a broadened notion of selfhood in which the boundaries between I and other, self and society, the individual and the world turn to lose significance. The most noted novels of this period, which my colleagues are going to talk in details about them during this conference, not only lack the sing singular voice of an of a narrator, but also freely switch between first and third person voices and shuttle back and forth in time, allowing the writers to furnish alternative perspectives for the same event and offer space for the internal monologues of the fictional characters, which draws the reader into the core of the literature, where the text, the author, and the reader merge into what must, must be regarded as the existential function of literature to create another world or to pay a tribute to the memory of Jamal Zadeh. It, 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 the Persian novel today is the realization had realized what was Jamal Zadeh's dream at the beginning of the century, the literary democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Yavari. Yeah, was very enlightening and uh, great description of process of development of Persian fiction. Um, I just, uh, before I open the floor for questions, I just wanted to ask you, if I may, um, with regard to the role of Jamal Zadeh in Persian novel, literature and fiction writing, um, uh, is it difficult or easy to period, uh, periodize, uh, you know, uh, the categorize the style of uh, fiction writing since Jamal Zadeh? You know, like, you know, you mentioned about Sadr Hedayat and Bozorg Alavi and others who followed, you know, how, how do we categorize their style and process of the fiction writing. In, in comparison with Jamal Zadeh? Yes. Uh, there is actually, if, uh, just, if we take into, just we take the, the case of Sadeh Hedayat. First of all, as Jamal Zadeh is more remembered by his first collection of this Yekibud Yekinabud, when we talk about Hedayat, we usually remember his Bufekur. He has written many other stories. He has collected did very much like Jamal Zadeh, glossary of, of the um, folkloric terms. And he has written about the the But when we talk about uh, the, the impact, the effect of Zedayat on Persian literature, we, we talk about his Bufekur. I think at least to my understanding. Hedoya's ability to, to look at the mirror and to see whatever he blames the others for, to see the traces of those, those 
characters that he he blames that he does not like to see them in his own own face and to to notice the similarities instead of distinction distinction and then difference actually put him much ahead of of a person like Michel Foucault and all those that advocated this question of I and other and like, like an Orientalist like Edward Said, because it is a sort of central question of, 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 our, our, of our century, the way that I and other are treated in different culture and, and uh, countries. Actually, this is what I was I said when um, in, in India University of uh, Delhi they um, they celebrated the 80th um, year of the publication of, of the Blind Art, and I gave Hedaya um, this uh, this distinction as a writer to put himself at the center of the century's question and write such, an, such a beautiful story that there is no distinction between the pre-Islamic and Islamic. There is no distinction between Dr. Asiri, the serial girl, and the one that he, the Zane Lakote. There is no distinction between the butcher and the narrator. It is an, at, it is an ability to grow in a way that instead of blaming the other, tracing the roots of corruption, of whatever you do not like in yourself, this is the way that change comes possible. Jamal Zadeh's story does not follow such a line. But after, after Hedayat, we see many, we see many, many novelists. You have invited one of them, Mr. Amandanipur, that I, I admire his, his works, and um, Golshiri, for example. Golshiri Shadeh Tejab, he had mentioned in one of his interviews that when he was writing this story, he found himself in the, in the atmosphere that Hedayat had written Bufakur. This is how a novelist, a story writer, influences the, 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 the development of the, whatever happens after him. Jamal Zadeh is admired. He, he, had, he was he had, in many ways, but we do not find many, many novelists who have written the way that Jamal Zadeh has produced his work. But many writers, they have not imitated him, Hedayat. They have written novel stories, but those are the lines that, so we can put Hedayat's name as, as, um, along with Nima Yushis, the way that Nima changed the whole structure and language of, of poetry that we, in a way we can divide the po Persian poetry with such a great history, with such so many great poets to before and after Nima. Such a thing could not be easily said in the in case of Jamal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'll just see if there are any questions. What about our fellow um, panelists? Do they have any comment or question? While we're waiting again, um, um, the tradition of um, the storytelling um, from the time of you know, earlier period, you know, for instance, like the stories in Shahnameh and uh, other earlier literature, um, how much have been, they have been transmitted? I know that, for instance, when I was reading um, the abstracts of uh, Mr. 
Mandani Pur um, brings to mind, you know, that kind of um, uh, traveling or like a travelogue um, of going, traveling back and forth in the thoughts and history. Um, do you find this was a kind of a tradition or, or style of Jamal Zadeh to some extent because, you know, his uh, Yeki Bud, Yeki Nabud and his other writings was like a, a person who had traveled and observed, you know, the events of the time. Um, and he reported those in form of his stories. Of observing, I do agree, but traveling, you see that the, usually the stories of Jamal Zadeh, they follow a linear line in the, in the narratives. So the, in the, when we, if you compare it with Bufekur of, of many other works, or Shazdeh Tejab, the character travels back and forth. Many of the most parts of Shazdeh Tejab is the way that Shazdeh remembers his past. And but the characters of Jamal Zadeh, they live at the present time and usually in a in a in a place that in a kind of world space that the story happens within we do have in persian literature like like nezami um, safekar for example that many many of the characters in many of the stories the the, the boundaries between present and past are blurred but I rarely notice such a thing in Jamal Zadeh's work. Jamal Zadeh, his main, main contribution is just advocating the simplicity of the language with, with his very, very present, um, with the, the satiric language that he uses. So makes it, a, the, the reader of Jamal Zadeh's story Reading these stories is a pleasure. Most of those who read Bufekur, Bufekur denies the pleasure of, of that regular pleasure of, of reading his story. Reading Bufekur is a task, is the travel that the reader has to go. To enter that, to enter that space, and that is what I said, that in the, then the text, the reader, and the writer, they merge into one. And that one, as a novel like Bufekur promises, is to create another world. It's such a transformation that not shape out in Jamal Zadeh's story. Jamal Zadeh bring, brings the, the, the dire things that he does not like into the attention of the reader. But uh, transformation through reading is something that you can experience with the, with the works of the great writers of the century, like Proust and the, so it's not that easy to, to, to follow the line, but when you take the journey, you learn a lot and you change and you transform, which is the, Thank you. the gift of literature to the world. Thank you very like much. Like the poetry okay. of our first. Right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Tahiri. I can see that, you know, she has raised her hand. Dr. Tahiri, the farmer. Thank you so much, Hurajan, for your insightful talk. And I saw two questions in the Q&A section, which I thought uh, Mr. Roshan was talking to you and didn't notice them. I want to uh, read one of them for you. Uh, the first one is, how has censorship affected and shaped literature and storytelling in Iran in the last 100 years? I know this is a very general question, but we will appreciate if you just point to it and uh, give us your opinion about it. And I will let uh, Mr. Roshan to read the next question after you finished answering to this question. Thank you. Actually, 
this kind of writing goes, the history of that goes much before the appearance of modern Persian fiction. You look at Tariq Behaqi as an example. Tariq Behaqi is the very telling example of bringing the story of other periods of history, like the, 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 the age of Anur Shirvan or Harun or Rashid or many others. And just insert them in the narrative when you are writing about Mas'ud Ghaznavi. What he cannot say, he cannot talk about in the present time, he, <clears throat> he, he expresses through these stories that he, he chooses and inserts in the narrative of the, of the, of the previous centuries and previous periods of the century. There are so many techniques and uh, that the, the novelists also have benefited. The, poem, the Persian poetry is a very good example of that, that the, the metaphoric language of, of the poetry and the, I believe that when the first Persian, Persian historical novelists, the very, very first of them, that instead of writing about the contemporary history, they, all these stories took place in uh, at least at least six, seven centuries ago. They have used the same technique and they have talked about what they wanted to say and was not possible to be told. So they, they incorporated the idea in the stories that they brought to the text from the previous centuries. I think this is one of the one of the one of the techniques that most the novelists and the poets they use when uh, and um, with metaphoric language and it, it actually it adds a sort of um, beauty and um, to the to the text because the direct language at least to my taste um, probably does not. Uh, appeal the readers as much as they, they just force upon them a sort of a sort of thinking and extracting the 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 idea from the text it's a very very common technique that in anywhere in the world the the, the, the novelists and the poets they, thank you very much i i read the second question um there a person who's asking that say, she's saying that she's interested in the distinction between islamic and pre-islamic iran in the literature of this period what was the impact of the by of this binary on other intellectuals of this period how much were these authors influenced with the nationalism of the period, for example, Akhunzade, etc. And how much did they influence the nationalism of this period and beyond? Actually, this a hundred years ago, if you on the years the Iranian culture experienced a sort of important notion and concept of nationalism. Mm -hmm. Loving Iran, and so it is a very a, a common theme in Persian literature, but the way that it is treated in at the end of 19th century, at the beginning of, of, of 20th century in Persian literature and in Persian culture is not limited to the works that are produced by novelists or and poets. 
for example, the Kitab Iran Bastan by Pirnia is, um, is published. Even when a dynasty change happens in the country and the Khajar dynasty goes and the Pahlavi, so the, 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 the name of the dynasty goes back to the pre Islamic. So, pre Islamic history of Iran at the at least three, four decades of the 20th century captures the Im imagination of the Iranians. And we see the, the expression of that in the literary works, in the poetry of Bahar, for example, in the poetry of, of many poets of, of, of that period. It is, and even Hedayat that we, we talked about, if you go to the, to the historical novels of Hedayat or historical dramas that Hedayat has written, and one of them is Parvin Dukhtar Sassan. If we compare Parvin Dukhtar Sassan, the language that Hedayat uses, and the way that he clearly defines the boundaries between the characters, the Iranian characters, and the, the Arab characters, because it happens in Ray or Raga to, at the 20 years after the, the defeat of Iranians by the, um, and by the Arab armies. But the difference, what distinguishes Hedayat is that he does not stay for a long time in this land of distinction. Hedayat travels, goes to India, spends years there, learns Pahlavi and tries to, and has translated some texts. It is after that, after that observation and thinking and reinvestigating all the things that have propelled this distinction that Herayat writes Bufakur. Many images, many figures that have appeared in, in Parvin Dokhtar Sassan they reappear in Bufeku, but in a different way. And uh, I think that was, that was the, what happened at the, the first decades of the century. And, and um, all, uh, we owe a lot to the Persian writers for bringing the, the contemporary history to the text and just distancing themselves from that glorified imagined past that had nothing to do with reality. All the, I, I, the, the articles that happened uh, appeared in the Encyclopedia Ironica. They show that many things that we do, we do not like in the Islamic period of history were present in the pre-Islamic history of Iran. So um, I think this is, this is an awareness uh, that we owe a lot of that to our novelists and short story writers. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for just one last question. Unfortunately, we don't have, enough, our time is actually, we're going over time. Um, it, the next question is in Iranian Persian history, there is a, a a wonder precious book, wonderful precious book, um, which is called this um, Hes Vadel, written by Sibak Neshaburi, um, which all no, the characters. No, Hosno Del, Hosno Del, I think. Hosno Vadel, uh, um, Characters are human body, organs, or human emotions, such as. Uh, Hemat, um, Galb, Gisu, but it did no, it did not continue, or uh, at least I have not seen in the Iranian literature movement even uh, in the West. Just, uh, it is a very, very important question. I've, I have this book and I have read it, but to talk about it and the, the way that the reasons that the, uh, why the book is distinguished or does not have that much followers either in Iran or the West, it, it, it just requires, uh, you see, a, a more comprehensive study on my side to be able to talk about it. But it is a very interesting book. 
and I'm glad that it is brought into attention of the participants in the, of the conference. I, do, I cannot add anything that I, I do have a lot of respect for the listeners and for the conference, not to talk when I've not studied properly the, the, the well, thank you very much. We have one or two more questions, but I think we run out of time. And I would um, like to take the opportunity of thank you, thanking Professor Yavari sincerely for this wonderful and insightful presentation um, that we all really uh, learn a lot. And we thank you very much for that. Thank you so, so much for giving me the opportunity for, and for meeting meeting you for, for that uh, after such a long time and my the, the, all the people that I've, I've, I've had the privilege of knowing the, the reading their works and I've never met like Hanum Tahiri and uh, Professor Karima and uh, Dr. Nanket. Thank you so I'm, I'm so so honored for, for the invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you for accepting our invitation and for a very insightful talk you gave to the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Passing on to Professor Karima. Thank you so much, Mr. Roshan, and thank you for such an excellent uh, first session. What a kick off to the conference, Professor uh, Yavari. That was uh, incredible. I've learned so much. Um, I welcome you again to uh, the first um, panel of the conference on contemporary Persian literature, a look at book production in Iran. Um, I look forward to the lecture, which will be delivered by Dr. Leticia Nanket, uh, who is a senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Um, using a soci sociological approach, she works on contemporary Persian literature in Iran and in the diaspora. Her first book, Orientalism versus Occidentalism, Literary and Cultural Imaging Between France and Iran Since the Islamic Revolution, came out in 2013. And her second book, which just came out in 2021 with Edinburgh University Press, is titled uh, uh, Iranian Literature After the Islamic Revolution, Production and Circulation in Iran and the World. Uh, her work also appeared in leading journals, including Iranian Studies, The Translator, and Inter uh, Intervention. And with that, I welcome uh, Dr. Nanket, uh, and I give her the ground. Thank you very much. We have, um, I think we have 40, almost 35, 40 minutes uh, to listen to Dr. Nanket's um, lecture, and then we'll take um, Q&A for another 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Karima. I'm just trying to share my screen. Can you confirm mm -hmm. you can see it? Yes, yes, yes. we can see you it can very see well. The PowerPoint. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, if you can just put it on the presentation mode, um, that'll be uh, fantastic. Thank you. I'm actually going no, to please. leave it like this because I need my notes which are on the same screen. Ah, Is that okay? Can okay. you see it? That's absolutely no? fine. Yes, yeah, okay. thank great. you. Thanks, Leticia. Well, thanks so much, Karima, for the introduction, and thanks a lot to Masoud um, for organizing this discussion, to um, ANU and professors uh, Tari and Lashir for hosting us, and to everyone for joining. Um, so today what I'm going to do is um, talk about the production of books within Iran after the uh, 1979 revolution in the context of a book that I published on contemporary Iranian literature just a few months ago. So I'm going to talk for about maybe 30, 35 minutes, um, and then we'll, we'll have time to discuss. So what I'll do first is that I will give you an idea of the book, uh, its main arguments for context uh, for about 10 minutes, and then uh, I'll go into the details of a chapter, which is about book production and circulation in Iran, uh, which I think will be of most interest to this audience to discuss the history of contemporary Persian literature. Um, so the book is about the Iranian literary field um, after the revolution of 1979. So it studies how literature, and I focus mostly on prose, uh, it studies how literature has functioned and circulated in the past 40 years 
both within Iran and in the countries of the Iranian diaspora. I focus on North America, Western Europe and Australia, uh, which are countries where I lived in the past 12, 12 years. So the first part of the book is on Iran, and I look at the forms, the structures, and the functions of Iranian literature within Iranian society. And in the second part, I turn to the global um, diaspora. So the book is not, I want to say from the start, the book is not a book about literary criticism. I don't do close readings of um, literary text. It's not either uh, a, a socio-political approach to Persian text. It's really a sociology of Iranian literature, uh, trying to understand how literature works within um, Iranian society within Iran and outside of the country. And um, what I do is I study Iranian literature after the revolution um, comparatively. So the comparison is on two levels. First, I look at um, the relationship of the literary field with other fields, so the political field, the social field, the economic field. And uh, the, the second level of the comparison is to look at Iranian literature as a global phenomenon uh, with comparisons between countries where Iranian literature has an important place. And it was very important for me to look at both Iran and the diaspora uh, at the same time because they often research fields that are separate. Um, there's been a lot of amazing work uh, done on Iranian American literature, for example. Um, so I'm using some of this and expanding the scholarship to look at other countries, um, mostly France and Australia, and to look at issues of circulation um, in a comprehensive way. So I'm not focusing on just one country. I see Iran not only as a nation state, but also as an identity and a belonging space. So what Benedict Anderson calls an imagined community. And this is why I study also works written by Iranians outside of Iran in other languages than Persian, mostly in French and in English. And my idea is that literatures from Iranian across the world um, sort of produce um, small clusters of Iran outside its borders, either in Persian or in the local languages. So my aim in the book is to describe the Iranian literary field in all its complexity, in all its variations. And I wanted to narrate several aspects of the story of contemporary literature. So I mentioned already both what happens within Iran and what happens in the diaspora. Uh, within Iran, I wanted to look at all the different sectors of the literary field, so both the independent, the underground, the examini, the governmental, the dolati, uh, which is often neglected in English-speaking scholarship. I also wanted to look at uh, canonical literature as well as popular literature and children's literature. And finally, uh, the local, the national and the global levels and all the connections in between. So it's a pretty big scope. Um, and that's why I've refrained from engaging too much with poetry, because poetry has quite different dynamics. Um, I do talk a lot, a bit about it in a couple of chapters, uh, but um, it's probably the topic for a different book. Uh, but I think it's really important that all these voices and layers and strands are taken into account together and looked at together. To basically to show the richness and complexity of Iranian literature today. So this has been possible uh, thanks to the many uh, literary people who helped me by sharing their knowledge and their insights and they've helped me to understand the sophistication of the Iranian literary field both within Iran and in the diaspora. So I want to take um, the occasion to thank them here. Uh, just a, a little bit about the method. I won't go too deep into the question of methodology, but just a few words to say that the book is based on the mix of uh, distant reading and close reading. That's what we, uh, that terms we use in literary studies. Um, I have also done lots of field work and interviews um, in both Iran and um, the countries I've mentioned. Um, I don't really do uh, lots of close reading, but I have very short um, uh, passages. I use digital humanities method with large amounts of data, and that's why, uh, and that's what I'm going to um, look at a bit more in details today. Um, I think my French background has been important because I'm really influenced by Pierre Bourdieu and his theory of the literary field. So I, I've basically adapted Bourdieu's theory uh, to the Iranian context, um, and it's sort of the driving theory behind the book. 
the fieldwork is very important to this book. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to go to Iran over the last 15 years, and um, this has really informed my knowledge of the field in ways which would have been impossible without those visits. Uh, I haven't been able to go since 2007, and um, it's, it's a question of access that probably many of us working on Iran um, have at the moment. Um, so just jumping to the main findings now, um, I must say that some of my conclusions can be seen as a bit bleak maybe, especially when it comes to the enclosure of the Iranian literary field. Um, Iranian literature within the country, within Iran, has many constraints. Um, there are the constraints imposed by um, the sanctions from the US government, the European Union and Australia. There are issues linked to censorship. There are also a lot of internal divisions of the Iranian literary field, for example, between independent and governmental. And the gap also between, the, uh, between Iran and the diaspora is another element that adds to this enclosure. Um, but my idea is that while there may be little exchange across national borders, so very little exchange, let's say, between Iranian French and Iranian Australian, um, Iranian diasporic literatures are well integrated into the national literary fields to which they contribute. And diasporic Iranian writers tend to be really invested in their local cultures. So to sum up on these findings, my conclusions probably go against the grain of some of the current thinking in the field of uh, post-colonial and world literature, um, which tend to see an increase in um, transnational exchanges and the disappearance of national borders. This is definitely not what we see um, happening in the case of Iran and the diaspora. But at the same time, I could not have reached these findings without studying the Iranian literary field with this global um, lens in mind. Um, right, so just uh, uh, an overview of the book. Um, the, first part, the first part of the book focuses on post-revolutionary Iranian literature within Iran, and the second part is on um, Iranian literature globally and the nation's relation with the diaspora. I'm not going to go into the details of the chapter, um, and what I'd like to do now is to focus on chapter four which is about book production in Iran. And um, uh, Omid has uh, kindly published a version of this chapter in uh, his co-edited uh, book, uh, which, which was published a couple of months ago. So to analyze contemporary Persian literature, it's important to study not only the text themselves, but also how they are produced and circulated. Um, the structures of the field really determine what texts, which texts are allowed, which texts are possible, or which texts are unimaginable. So that's why in, in the first section of the book, I look at the forms and genres of literary text, mostly prose, within Iran. I explore the impact um, of digital literature on the evolution of the literary field. I also describe how the field functions in details. Um, I talk about censorship, um, uh, the history of censorship, how censorship works in very concrete ways. Uh, I look at sanctions. I look at the divide between uh, the different sections, the Dolati, Khosusi, the Zamini, and all the constraints um, of the field. Um, so in, in this chapter four, I'm going to talk about um, now is um, the chapter is using data from Khane Iketab, the Iran book house, to understand uh, what is production and circulation like since the revolution. And the idea is to try to confirm some ideas uh, uh, often um, suggested by scholars of contemporary Persian literature. For example, uh, the ebb and flow of publications according to politics. And uh, in some cases, uh, I will contradict some other um, ideas such uh, as that, that uh, governmental publishers publish higher quantities of text than independent ones. This is actually not the case when you look at the numbers. So my idea really is to give precise figures to phenomena that are usually sketched um, and, that, uh, and, and to use data to, um, to, to confirm or contradict some ideas. Uh, right. 
So it's well known by everyone working um, with literature in Iran that the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, Ershad, um, buys copies of books important to its ideology. So the most reliable data that we have on the Iranian market is actually the publication of books. It's not the sales. If I were going to do this study in a Western country, I would probably look at the sales, but for Iran, we need to look at, um, at the uh, production. So what I'm going to do is to compare data from uh, Khanei Ketab to the discourse of literary practitioners I have been exposed to when doing field work um, in Iran between 2006 and 2017. I use the Khanei Ketab data as my primary source um, to understand the production of books within Iran. I think it provides the most reliable data um, Khane Ketab is a governmental institute. Uh, it was officially funded in 1993 um, and it's the entity that gives uh, ISBNs to publishers. It also publishes journals, it organizes literary prizes. Um, we must remember that it's a governmental institute, so it doesn't take into consideration books that are produced outside of the official networks um, and books that don't get uh, an ISBN. Uh, and um, that's usually the books published uh, underground, what we call underground in black and gray book markets. Uh, but I tend to think that underground original publications are actually um, scarce. They're not published in very high numbers. Um, so I use three key resources. The first one is a report um, that the uh, Iran Book House published in uh, 2016 on statistics of books, uh, of book publishing in all categories between 1980 and 2016, on the occasion of the publishing of uh, one million books since the revolution. Uh, that's this report. Uh, so they updated the report and they published it in English in 2017. I refer to both the English and the Persian versions because they're slightly different. The second resource I'm using um, is um, data that I have obtained directly from Iran Book House for literary books only. Um, and um, uh, someone who worked there, uh, Esmail Khafari, uh, one of the writers of the report, actually shared these uh, Excel sheets with me uh, containing all information on books in the category of literature and is happy for me to, you know, share the data and uh, for me to mention his name. And he's been really, really helpful in um, helping me in this research. And the third resource I'm um, um, comparing is the report uh, writer's block. Uh, the story of censorship, censorship in Iran, which is produced by an independent research lab uh, called Small Media, which is a UK-based institute. Um, they don't have direct access to Iran, so the method was to uh, scrap the data from the Iran Book House website. Um, so there are slight differences between these three um, resources, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, in, in a moment. It's important to note that small media and the two resources from uh, Iran Book House come from very different political sites. Um, Iran Book House is a governmental institution. Uh, on the other hand, small media is an institution based outside Iran, which is clearly opposed to the uh, foundational ideas of the Islamic Republic regime. Uh, but all in all, uh, their readings of the data overlap mostly and I think that's a, that's a testimony to the validity of the data as well as to you know the, the relative accuracy of the construction of the data. Um, in terms of categories of books we'll look we're talking about um, religious books composing about 17% um, of publication uh, then we've got children's and young adult literature, as well as applied sciences, each at um, 14 percent, and literature is at 13 percent. So it's quite important um, and almost equal to the most published uh, categories. Um, now I'm going to talk about what one of the first um, ideas I'm looking at in this chapter, which is how is literary production tied to governments in place. 
um, when you talk to people uh, working in literature in Iran, they almost always mention the years of uh, Khatami's presidency, uh, so between 1979 and 2005, as a golden age for publishing, and they criticize the periods preceding and following uh, Khatami. So I wanted to compare this um, idea with the data on the topic. And on this figure, figure one, um, it shows the evolution of the total volume market. Um, so that is the total number of books published. And you can see that uh, the data for Rouhani's presidency, which is uh, 2013 to 2021, shows a small increase, but it's too, um, too small to be interpretable. So you can see quite clearly the year of uh, Khadami's uh, help and, and help and boom in, in publications, and then, and then there's a big, big drop of um, more than 50% uh, after 2005. Uh, on figure two, uh, that shows the number of books published since uh, 1979, according to small media. Um, so that's that's pretty much a, a similar um, a similar uh, graph, but uh, seen through the eyes of small media and not through the eyes of Iran Book House. Uh, you can see the same increase uh, during um, the uh, Khatami's presidency. Uh, you can see that Khamenei's presidency, which which is the years um, during the war against Iraq, um, was a really a period of stagnation for book production. Uh, during Rafsanjani's presidency, uh, Rafsanjani was a conservative, there was a bit of an increase. And then when Khadami um, became his Minister of Culture and Islamic Guidance for a time, um, uh, there, there was a bit of an increase, but Rafsanjani had also two other conservative ministers during his presidency. Um, Hama, uh, sorry, Ahmad Masjid Jamei, who was a reformist, had the position of Minister of Culture for the last years of Khatami's presidency, and it's only really with Khatami's presidency that uh, production boomed. And you can see that there was a decrease with um, Ahmadinejad's first term, which banned altogether some writers without allowing them to even go through the process of submitting their books to the Arshad. And then there was another decrease um, at the beginning of his second term in 2009, which saw massive upheavals in the country and which had a really important impact on literary life. Um, people in the sector mention uh, Keto Obsazi, which basically means building books, making up books as a factor to take into consideration when we are looking at books produced during um, Ahmadinejad's presidency. Um, sorry, I'm just moving there. Uh, and this is something to, sorry, just moving back to figure two, because um, even though you can see a very sharp decline after Ahmadinejad, there's still a lot of Ketopsazi building books um, going on. Um, figure three shows similar data from the Iran uh, Bookhouse report, and that includes a few more years of data from uh, Rani's presidency uh, up to um, uh, 2016. So in the previous three graphs, um, that were the numbers of books published over the last uh, 40, year, 40 years. Sorry. An important aspect to remember is that the number of copies um, is a different matter altogether. And there's been a huge decline in number of copies published per book over the last um, decades. And everyone mentions it in the field. And this is also something you can see here uh, on this graph, the number of copies produced per title. Uh, per year. So it used to be like in the early years of the Islamic Republic that uh, a book was printed in maybe 8,000 copies. Um, uh, but the standard number in the late 2010s is more around 1,500 copies, maybe just 1,000 copies per book title. So this figure gives the uh, average number of copies per book and really confirms the, the drastic decline that literary practitioners mention. Um, we, we can talk about reasons for this. Uh, there's the fact that the price for books has increased a lot in the shrinking economic space. There's the rise of e-books, there's uh, pirated books. Uh, the absence of copyright laws are um, some factors that can explain this um, decrease. 
Now I'd like to talk about um, the question of translations. Um, the issue of translated text versus text in Persian is a fraught one because it relates to issues of dependency on foreign markets and foreign languages and on the quality of local production compared to the foreign one. So that's why it's critical to get the numbers right. Um, there's no doubt that Iran publishes many translations, but so do a lot of non-English speaking Western countries. And I just want to make a really brief comparison with France because it's sometimes enlightening to uh, put things into context. Um, someone who studied this space said that in the late 1990s, a percentage of translated text is uh, 15 to 18 percent in France and Germany, 25 percent in Italy and Spain, and 40 percent in Greece. So out of the total of all published books, um, these percentages are translations. And in all these places, English is by far the most translated language. Uh, for France, it represents two thirds of the books translated into French. So um, there's, there's the dominance of the book market in English. It's now a global phenomenon uh, that all literatures translate a lot of English books. And I think what's interesting in this um, comparison is to is the fact that although Iran is isolated from the global book market in many um, ways, it still follows similar trends. Um, and that's, that's interesting in itself. Oops, sorry. Um, so what, what um, I believe is important is to look at the evolution of the field of translation and to ask if there have been any significant changes in the proportion of translations versus um, originals um, over the years. Uh, so that's my figure to think about this. It shows an increase in the number of publications of original books compared to translations over the years. Um, in 1994, there was uh, around one third of all books uh, that were translations versus two thirds original. Uh, and in uh, 2015, there were um, only 15% translations versus 80, uh, sorry, 19% translation versus 81% uh, of originals. So the production of books written in Persian in the original has increased four times more rapidly than that of translation um, in, a, in a 40 years period. Um, so we can ask if it's due to policies um, that aim to minimize cultural imperialism. Um, and of course, cultural imperialism is a big uh, topic at the beginning of the Islamic revolution. And it's one of the foundations of the Islamic Republic regime. Um, is it a consequence of the building up of books, these kitabs as um, I have mentioned, uh, especially during the two Ahmadinejad governments? Um, especially because lots of the books uh, that are um, considered as Kitab Sazi are academic thesis that are in Persian. So it's, it's, it's probably a combination of, of factors. If we look at the data only for the category of literature, not, not for all books, um, it's still true that originals are more numer numerous than translations. There's probably around 30% translations uh, from foreign literatures in the later years. But the number of translations versus originals has not decreased so much over the years. And critics often comment on the fact that um, Iranian readers don't read contemporary Iranian fiction. When they're looking for fiction, they're, um, they're going towards foreign uh, fiction. Um, but I believe that publications of original uh, poetry in Persian, Iranian poetry, sort of compensate for that since they have increased over the last 40 years. So you've got a, quite a big divide between what's happening in prose, which is a field where lots of things are translated and poetry, uh, where this is not so much um, the case. And the biggest area for translations is uh, children and young adults literature. Um, let me slide on that. 45% uh, of its publications come from translation. Um, and then uh, that's applied sciences and then literature. Um, other fields like religious or academics books are mostly um, original. 
So when we talk about translation in, in the Persian book market and in the Persian literary field, it's important to see that there are actually big uh, divides between uh, the categories uh, of books we, we talk about. Um, and including within one category like literature, there's a big difference between fiction where you have lots of translation and contemporary poetry where uh, it's mostly Persian originals. Um, next, I'm going to talk about um, centralization, the centralization of the book market. So Iran's publishing industry is very centralized. Um, Tehran has whole, always been the central point of publication and it has become increasingly so. Um, it's not something that's particular to Iran. If you look at the French literary field, it's also very, very centralized with most literary activities and prestigious centers being in Paris. So um, again, it's important sometimes to think about comparisons. Um, here on this slide, uh, you can see uh, the curve in black, which shows the production in Tehran, and the dotted line indicates um, the production in the provinces. Um, if you were to take away the productions from Qom and Mashhad, which are the big religious centers, um, and where you have lots of uh, religious books, uh, the production in provincial cities would be very low. Um, I compare this data to, uh, I'm, I'm just looking at one year, um, the year 2012, to give you an idea uh, of where books are sitting. So you can see that 75% of books were published in Tehran. Um, and then that's Rome and Mashhad, where you have a lot of uh, religious books and, and then some um, uh, other provincial um, cities. I think centralization is important to consider because, um, and it is a concern because it's not compensated by good distribution networks. If you had, you know, good distributions between the provinces and Tehran, then it wouldn't be such an issue. But de facto, what's happening is that the provinces in Iran get very little access to new publications um, and, and they don't really get access to, to books um, published in the capital. Right, and the last point I want to study um, is um, the distinction between independent and governmental publishers. Um, so the most prolific publishers, um, maybe contrary to expectations, are not religious and governmental publishers, but publishers working in the academic field. And it's not exclusive, of course, some uh, governmental publishers can be uh, publishers working in the academic field, uh, but mostly the academic publishers are actually independent. The field of book exams preparation, for those of you who grew up in Iran, uh, the concours, Ketabe concours, uh, it's a huge field, it's a huge market. Uh, the entry examination to universities is really crucial to the higher uh, education system and it represents a whole industry in itself. So you've got specialist publishers like um, Mopta Keran and Gadge and they're competing for the market. On uh, the, the last slide I want to share, uh, this is um, from uh, 1979 to 2016. You can see that governmental publishers um, only publish 12% of books. Most books are, are produced by independent publishers. So today, independent publishers publish seven times more books than governmental publishers. And it's important to remember that even what I call independent publishers are not always entirely independent from the government. Um, for example, during some periods, most publishers receive uh, paper supplies from the government, um, so it's an important financial contribution. It's also quite common for independent publishers to receive direct funding from the government from time to time. So it's important not to draw a strict line between, you know, Josusi and Dolati independent and, um, and governmental. Uh, but all publishers in Iran, except the ones which are underground, the ones who um, that don't receive an ISBN, they have to stay in line with the government, they have to send their book uh, to the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance to go through censorship. So the distinction really is not so much on, um, uh, 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 the distinction really is about their ideological alignment or not with the government. The independent publishers take the position that um, 
what they're producing is more important uh, than their ideological alignment and the government publishers um, uh, decide that uh, the ideology is more important that, than the content, basically. It's a very broad brush distinction, but at some point we need to, um, to draw some lines. Um, on, on that, um, just to finish off on the topic of governmental publishers, some of them are absolutely huge in size um, and they get lots of support from the government. Uh, uh, you can think of uh, Suremer, which is the publishing press of the Jose Onari, uh, but actually most of the production in terms of numbers is, is done by um, independent in terms of quantity. Um, and if we think about the support and so on, that's a very different uh, topic altogether. But here, I just wanted to look at the, at the numbers. All right, so I'm just going to conclude. Um, so I'm going to sum up by saying that um, studying different resources, all devoted to book production, um, I hope um, is going to provide some uh, verifiable uh, and cross-checkable answers. Um, so, as I mentioned, all these resources come from the uh, Hane Ketab and they've been selected and treated in different ways uh, by two different institutions uh, that have different aims and different agendas. But the fact that they come from one source could be seen as an issue, of course. But I think I've shown that it's quite a reliable source in the uh, current Iranian context. Um, and the fact that the results um, overlap nonetheless, mostly, uh, apart from the very last years, which are possibly subject to, um, you know, inaccurate recordings in database, makes me confident in the um, validity to help us understand um, several elements in the field. Um, so what I looked at today was the link between uh, book production and who's in government, uh, the decline of the number of copies published, uh, since the revolution, the decreasing amount of translations versus original text in Persian, uh, the increased centralization of book production in Tehran, and finally, uh, the relative minority of governmental publishers compared to independent publishers. Uh, so I want to end by reinforcing the fact that having a broad view of the field and using a variety of sources is really key to understand it in all its complexities. Um, and that uh, it's important to look not only at the text themselves, but ha at how they are produced and, and circulated. Uh, and I believe this will lead nicely to a mid talk, which is also about examining the possibility and the impossibility of certain kinds of literature in the um, Iranian context. So I'll finish here and I thank you everyone uh, for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Leticia. I genuinely look forward to reading the book. Uh, that was a really um, very powerful presentation. If you, might, if you don't mind sharing the screen so that I could see if there are any hands raised for questions. Thank you so much. So um, uh, please, uh, colleagues, raise your hands or put your questions in the Q&A. Meanwhile, I'm just going to ask Leticia a couple of questions. Um, so uh, this is really fascinating. I was thinking, um, time and again about the literary field in the Arabic speaking world, which is my area of research, and the dominant notions on world literature. And I'm looking forward to hear from Omid about that as well. I look forward to reading his latest edited volume on that. And there is that dominant um, perception that um, world literature is all about translation in English. There is that dominance of the Anglophone world and the space of circulation. Any literature can be um, world literature only when it's translated to English. When it's not, then of course it hasn't made it to the world. And that's because it's very Eurocentric and very much dependent on European markets um, of circulation and production. I was thinking when you were talking about the book production in Iran, um, what is, how do you define the literary uh, space of circulation of Persian literature? Like, is it circulated within Iran and the uh, Persian speaking world outside Iran and how does it work in terms of um, you know being circulated outside Iran you know outside um, the the specified circle I'm just thinking here in comparison with the Arabic speaking world and how there is a pan-Arab uh, literary space uh, that is extremely rich and diverse and it doesn't need to be 
translated to the world to make it toward literature. It already has these millions of readers um, in the pan-Arabic sphere. And I was also thinking in terms of your connection between um, the regime and book production, um, and that in at times of a relaxed regime or progressive regime, there is more book production, and it makes a lot of sense. Again, I'm comparing it to the context I work with. In the Arab world, for example, uh, we did have and we still have authoritarian regime extending over a long period of time, but that, that did never curtail a rich production of literature. Um, and that's, again, because of that literary uh, space of circulation, because Arab authors can easily go to an independent publishing house in Beirut um, or somewhere in another Arab country where they can get their book published if they are censored. Um, in their own home country. I wonder how that worked uh, with the books you're working on. And I was also thinking that in the Arab world, there is that notion that the government do encourage uh, literary production, particularly literature and fiction, because that's the space where the citizens could blow off the steam. They, we call it 10 fees, you know, they could just let off the steam and criticize, but then they go back to their corners again. And of, of course, that helps in terms of the social contract between the citizens and, um, uh, and the state. And I wonder whether that's the case in Iran as well. Uh, um, thank you so much, uh, Leticia. If you can kindly respond to this point, and then I'll open the ground for discussion. Thank you. Yeah, lovely. Thanks a lot, Karima. There are many questions there. I'm not sure I can answer all of them, but uh, um, it's, it's really interesting to make the comparison with the uh, Arabic literary field. Actually, I, I started becoming really interested in looking at these issues, um, having been inspired by uh, Richard Jacquemont's uh, book on the Egyptian literary field. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been one, one of my inspirations. And um, things are working quite differently in Iran. Um, and, and what I do in the book is I, I work only on the national uh, Iranian space borders of Iran, uh, because if you look at Tajikistan and Afghanistan, which are the two other uh, current Persian speaking countries, um, we're looking at very different uh, dynamics and institutions and so on. So um, that, that wasn't the topic of the book. I must say that there is very little circulation between these Persian aid countries at the moment. There are things um, going on, especially with Afghanistan, for example, um, the Afghan literary space is less censored. Well, at least it was um, uh, until um, uh, recently. Um, it is less censored. So, for example, you you can. Um, I'm thinking of an example of a translation of Lolita by Nabokov, which is censored in Iran because of reasons because it doesn't go with the morality of the state. Um, it is, uh, there's been one translation uh, translated in Afghanistan and then uh, smuggled back into Iran and you can find it on the black market um, in Iran. Um, it is, it is an example. There are some examples. I'm thinking of, uh, for example, the uh, Australian Iranian uh, poet Granaz Musavi. She used to publish um, in Iran. Uh, her latest collection was published in Afghanistan um, for um, these sort of reasons. But we're talking about very small numbers of books. I don't think there's a very big circulation happening um, between these spaces. Um, and, and I would say that when censorship happens, um, writers don't have a lot of choice. They can either go underground, so either with print publications underground, or um, digitally, there, there is a bit more freedom uh, on the digital literary space. It's still very much, uh, controlled, uh, but there are things uh, like um, erotic poetry, for example, that you can find online that you could never find in print because of censorship. Um, so that's one option. The other option is for um, uh, writers to publish with um, publishers in the diaspora, but there is a lot of, there is a big gap between the two spaces. And um, there are some publishers who, who try to reach readers within Iran, uh, publishers um, uh, situated based in uh, Western uh, countries, um, but we're still talking about very, very small numbers of, um, of exchanges. Great, thank you. Um, uh, colleagues, do raise your hands if you have questions. I see there is one in the Q&A, but Leticia, can I ask you about um, the difference between uh, literature produced within Iran and outside in the diaspora. 
Um, I did a lot of work on diasporic literature by Franco Magribians in France, and I noticed that there is always um, a huge difference between the two categories in terms of subject of interest and what they are talking about. So even if it's written, the one I worked on were written in French, uh, but you know there is a connection there between Francophone and Arabophone in the region. But I noticed that um, although those who are written in <clears throat> those authors, let's say mother tongues, they do have other um, area of focus, like on exile, um, you know, being lonely, the you know, notion of belonging, whereas those who write from within Iran, they're very much uh, concerned with subjects or topics that are the everyday lived in Iran. So I wonder how this <clears throat> configuration, excuse me, works in terms of differentiating between the two uh, categories and whether the ones who write outside Iran always write in Persian and that's in the languages, for example, if you think of second, third descendants of um, Iranians. And my, la <clears throat> my last question about Bourdieu, I wonder how you use the Bourdieu theory in um, Iran, because of course Bourdieu theory is very much focused on the context of France, uh, very context-based, and the power of the markets. It's a free country in a way, there is a lot of uh, freedom in terms of circulation and publication, and his whole theory was about uh, canonicity and how authors make a name for themselves by deconstructing certain boundaries. Now, the context of Iran is very much different as you outlined it in terms of authoritarianism, censorship. So I wonder how you work that out. Um, and I can add to that a question by Michelle, uh, who's saying, if the data you analyzed revealed any insight into tendencies towards particular genre at various points in time. So if you can kindly answer these questions, then we could uh, take more from the ground. Um, thank you very much, Leticia. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Karima. Uh, so the question on the uh, distinction between the diaspora and Iran, that they, they are very different products, I would say. Uh, a lot of the um, production from Iranians outside of Iran um, is in local languages, mostly English, German, French. Uh, a lot of them are memoirs uh, talking about the revolution, their time, the adaptation to uh, to the country. You also have a lot of, uh, 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 especially first and second generation uh, writers publishing in Persian, uh, but I would say that um, their um, interest and topics don't really translate back so much into the interest of readers within Iran. And that's one of the additional um, things about this gap between the, the diaspora and Iran I was talking about. There are a lot of uh, uh, practical issues like financial issues, sanction and so on, but there's also a divide between what readers want to read and within Iran and, and outside. So I. Um, that, that's my very quick answer to, to a very complex question. Uh, the question of Bourdieu is interesting because, of course, Bourdieu was writing about 19th century France, so it's very, very different. And actually, the, the, the main idea of Bourdieu cannot, can absolutely not be applied to Iran. What I'm using is this theory of looking at the different um, fields, social, economic, uh, political, literary, and seeing how they interconnect together. But in the case um, of Iran, we actually have a very uh, close tie between literary field and political field. Um, that, that's how things work um, uh, today in Iran. And um, in Western countries, for example, today, uh, the, the, the divide is between the literary field and the economic field. We don't see that happening at all in Iran. Uh, there's this uh, hegemony of, of the political field, which, which bears a huge influence on what's happening, um, on, what's happening on, on um, literary productions and practices. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's, that's how I'm using it, just the, the ideas, but actually the, the, the ways things are working are actually opposite to what Bourdieu is, is, um, uh, is mentioning in, uh, in his studies. Um, uh, and then there was a question from Michelle. I was wondering if the data you analyze revealed any insights into tendencies towards particular genres at various points in time. Um, yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, there are uh, some genres which are, um, I mean, the evolution in terms of genres um, changes according to, um, you know, the evolutions happening in Iranian society. Um, I uh, will point out um, Omid's um, 
talk who's going to talk about crime fiction, I think it's a, a, an important one to, to talk about when we consider genre. The other one is probably um, the most obvious one is romances. Uh, romances uh, have become a huge um, uh, market in uh, uh, revolutionary Iran, maybe contrary to expectations. Um, the, the, the expert on the topic is Elham Naij. Uh, she finished her PhD at UNSW and she's worked uh, on that in very close details. Um, she would tell you that um, that uh, uh, romances, even the, the way the, the plot of romances have evolved a lot in the past 40 years. Um, and the sort of topics and the relationship between men and women that they describe. Uh, but you see a really huge boom of romances um, uh, after, um, in, in, in the past 20 years, um, I would say. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a broad topic, um, so I don't think I can go into the details, but that, that's a great question. Thanks, Misha. Right. Thank you very much, Leticia. Any more questions from the grounds, uh, colleagues? Um, if not, then I would like to bring this session to a close and uh, allow you uh, a couple of minutes to grab drinks or any things needed to go uh, to Professor Omid's second session. So we just resume in two minutes, please, just to allow you to grab water or whatever you would need for the next session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Leticia. That was a brilliant session. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Karima. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. That was a nice uh, break. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to um, um, continue with our fascinating discussion. And our next uh, panel and speaker is um, Professor Omid Azadebugar. And he's going to talk on Persian crime fiction and the formation of the modern state. Um, professor Azadibugar is a professor of comparative literature and translation at Hunan Normal University in China. He is the author of the Persian novel Ideology, Fiction and Form in the Periphery, published in 2014, and World Literature and Hidayat Poetics of Modernity, published in 2020, as well as a co-edited volume that came out in 2021, Persian Literature as World Literature, and he's currently the co-editor of the Routledge Companion to Global Comparative Literature. Um, so, Professor Azadipugar, the ground, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Karima. Uh, thank you very much also to Masoud for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be sharing my work in the company of great minds. Uh, Professor Yavari and Professor Nonket, Leticia. Uh, I'll be speaking about Persian crime fiction and the formation of the modern state in Iran. Um, um, as Leticia writes in her book uh, that she presented a chapter right now, uh, crime fiction is not a, uh, well, it's not one of the established genres of Persian, but there are a number of uh, books as well, not novels, as well as films that are using crime in various ways. And I am interested in looking at the way that they imagine the state. Now, I'll explain why this is important. Um, in European or classic crime fiction, uh, mostly British, the narrative unfolds against the background of the legitimacy of the state, belief in the rule of law, and the fairness of legal institutions. In this sense, the state is a social regulator and consists of legal institutions and law enforcement agencies that operate to protect the social order and the ideals of justice. So uh, European crime fiction assumes the existence of the state and legal institutions. In her work on the rise of the detective in early 19th century popular fiction in Britain, Heather Worthington writes about the ideological functions of the genres that preceded crime fiction, such as broadsides, and they were one-page papers with narratives of executions, which were ideological apparatuses of the control of the private. On the other hand, over the state-induced methods, such as the establishment of the police force or the use of capital punishment, were used to police the public, uh, the public spaces. So she talks about 
how all these uh, ideological methods and the overt state-induced methods were used in order to control people. In this sense, crime fiction rose to become an ideological tool that protected the status quo. As Franco Moretti also argues, whereas the novel was the genre of ambition and expansion, crime fiction was a conservative genre developed to protect the bourgeoisie against crime. Uh, crime is another word for the forced redistribution of wealth. So if wealth is not distributed, they will take it by force. So uh, Moretti talks about detective fiction is radically anti-novelistic because the aim of the narration is no longer the character's development into autonomy uh, or a change from the initial situation or the presentation of plot as a conflict and an, an evolutionary spiral. But what he says is that detective fiction's object is to return to the beginning. So uh, to sort of reset the bourgeois society. Crime fiction has also been used to project the power and sovereignty of the state. Um, and again, I'm quoting Heather Worthington that in the execution broadsides, the demonstration of sovereign or state power was encapsulated in pictures and probes. So that's one of the ways that uh, the state and the state institutions used crime in order to show the population that they are in charge. The circulation of such texts had a double function. It was an assuring reminder to the bourgeoisie that the state is in charge, and it was a threat to potential future criminals that the state will go to any lengths necessary in order to protect the social order. At the same time, the rise of crime fiction was not only concomitant with the development of sciences, uh, most importantly forensics, but also intertwined with the advancement of the legal discourse. Again, Franco Moretti, uh, he writes that detective fiction detaches prose narration from historiography and relates it to the world of law. In hard-boiled crime, fi crime fiction, which was the American version of crime fiction that developed in the U.S., the idea of the state is still relevant. The presentation of the state assumes a dystopian feature in which the rule of law and the justice system have been compromised and social corruption ensues from corporate and estate corruption. Critiques of this state of, affair, uh, of affairs calls into play the ideal role of the state. In American crime fiction, this ideal is evoked in order to contrast it with the corrupt reality and the criticism of the state is rooted in the necessity and unexpected absence of the rule of law. In this case, the detective, though flawed as an individual, becomes the legal, com uh, becomes the legal compass that exposes the corruption of the state. So the detective is no longer a super intelligent or ethical figure, but a flawed character. But through operating in the city, he exposes how uh, the rule of law and state institutions are corrupt. In his famous essay, The Simple Art of Murder, published as an introduction to a collection of short stories, Raymond Chandler, the American crime fiction writer, um, takes issue with the lack of reality in American adaptations of the classic British detective fiction. The American world, uh, the American world authors were to display and expose was different. So he goes on explaining and describing what this world was about. The realist in murder writes of a world in which gangsters can rule nations and almost rule cities in which hotels and apartment houses and celebrated restaurants are owned by men who made their money out of brothels. So he goes on and, and the last line he says, uh, because law and order are things we talk about but refrain from practicing. So he continues, after this passage, he continues to describe the features of the corrupt society that he sees in the United States. But what this implies is that the ideal state of law and order is in view, even if it doesn't materialize. So the ideal of the state and the legal regulation of society is in place. Exposing the corrupt reality, crime fiction 
therefore displays how all institutions of the rule of law have been compromised. In other words, this juxtaposition of the corrupt reality and the ideal world, this juxtaposition is meant to act as a reminder that the state is not supposed to be a perpetrator or complicit in crimes. In this world, this corrupt world of crime fiction, then the figure of the detective becomes a formal feature. Comparing American and Scandinavian crime fiction, Bruce Robbins argues that the unsocialized woman of a Scandinavian crime fiction, and the unsocialized woman is uh, someone like the girl with the dragon tattoo, she, her figure as a detective, represents the cold objective presence of the state as the ultimate bearer of justice. And then so he talks that he talks about identifying with what the audiences are identifying with is in fact the legitimacy of the state as the guardian of the general well-being. So the state as the guardian of the general well-being of the population. This is significant because as he gives an example in Roberta, from this perspective, the state is also the key to the development of the detective narrative. In Roberto Bolaño's 2666, the details of the crime scene are supplied, including the terrible things that have been done to the body. But the murder does not generate a mystery. The machinery of investigation does not rumble into action. Nothing happens. To transform murder into mystery, proper state operations must be in place for the change to happen. Not only the method for investigating the truth of the crime, but also belief in the value of truth in legal proceedings in a judiciary system that will restore justice to the world. The state is the source of treating murder as mystery. So that's about the significance of the state as a, in a state as a, the background of crime fiction. Now, in Persian uh, literature, murder does not often transform into mystery either. The relationship between crime and the state is present in many novels. In Sadr Chubak's Tangsir, 1963, the protagonist commits multiple murders because of the failures of the state to reinstate social justice. His murders, however, are celebrated as a revolutionary rage. In Danishvar Suvashun, 1969, the mysterious conditions under which the male protagonist dies, or perhaps killed, we don't know that for sure, these mysterious conditions do not trigger an investigation into the murder, but lead to the creation of a heroic martyr in an epic tone. Similarly, in Dola Tabari's Kalidar, 1984, the tensions between the state and rural populations becomes murder notes without the mysterious element. Nevertheless, there are samples of mystery and the figure of the detective as a formal element in the narrative changes throughout history in Persian crime fiction. The changing figure of the detective registers how the idea of the state has been imagined in literature and sheds light on the political philosophies that have shaped hard politics in modern Iran. The detective's role in solving the mystery, the relationship with the state, or the representatives of the state, and with criminals give us clues about the way modern society has been imagined to date. Now, I will particularly focus on crime fiction or what has been generally categorized as crime fiction. And in this case, crime is, is presented as a mystery that needs to be solved. And then I'll focus on three moments in the history of modern Persian literature. The first moment is the beginning of Persian crime fiction, at least until we find other texts that uh, were written before this work. The first one is Doruge Isfahan, or The Sheriff of Isfahan. It was published in 1925 at the beginning of the establishment of the first Pahlavi era, which launched the, na the National Modernization Project. The second 
moment is Feel That Tariki, Elephant in the Darkness, a noir novel published in 1979, just a year after the revolution, after a previous state model had been removed by the revolution to be replaced by a new model of the state. And finally, Karaga Alavi, or Detective Alavi, a crime series broadcast on the state television in 1996. Uh, it had two seasons. I'm going to talk about only the first season. This last instance, Karaga Alavi, is not strictly speaking a literary work, obviously, because it's on cinema. It was on, uh, broadcast on television. But it continues, uh, it contributes to the ideas of the state and the state formation and enjoyed a better success than the novels. Uh, I'll spare you the summary of the stories. Uh, this is uh, from the left. It's the uh, cover page of the first edition of the Sheriff of Isfahan. As you can see at the top, uh, for marketing purposes, the publisher has added the Sherlock Holmes of Iran. Uh, there are major differences between uh, this detective and Sherlock Holmes. In the middle, it's the cover page of Elephant in Darkness, and on the right side, you see the poster of the series. Now, in the first one, the detective is a judge. The retrospective narrative, because it was written, published in 1925, but it's about one point, uh, it's about the Qajari. Right? The retrospective narrative seems to be functioning as ideological justification for the prospective state. So it's talking about what happened in the past in order to justify the future. The governor of Isfahan is a Qajar prince, but he is corrupt and incompetent. At one point, the detective tells him, Your Honor, people have no friendship or intimacy, which means respect for you, and they obey you out of fear. This functions like a mini theory of a statehood proposing two methods of governance, fear of the sovereign or respect for him. Both are centered on the individual. The, abs the absent element, which is not mentioned anywhere in this text, is governance based on the rule of law. The fact that this theory is proposed by the detective, who is highly respected and the opposite figure of the corrupt, incompetent governor, limits all potential options for future state formation. From a legal perspective, the detective acts as a judge too. Uh, on a few occasions, he says, as he, the criminal, promised me not to steal anymore, I freed him. So he investigates the case, he discovers who the criminal is, but finally he forgives them, he lets people go. This is so important that the narrative actually const constructs the good reputation of the detective on this discerning ability. So time and again, uh, from the perspective of others, uh, the detective is admired for this ability to know who is the criminal, or to forgive them if necessary. In this case, the individual detective is functioning as the whole state. He is the detective, the police, the law, the judge, and the court, and he is able to make such decisions on the spot. Even at the end of the novel, the primary case that had triggered the whole narrative from the very beginning is dealt with in a similar fashion. After solving the mystery of kidnappings and thefts, and true to his own theory of governance with respect, the detective talks to the criminals who then complain about the competence of city governors. You are the sheriff of the city, says one of the people. Um, they are a tribe and they have been attacking city and city officials, kidnapping some people, uh, stealing uh, from them. How is it possible that Farrosh Bashi, one of the city officials, arrests people without your information or permission and loots their possessions even though you are, you are accountable for what happens. In this case, the perpetrator that has galvanized the conditions necessary for the crime narrative is the state. So the state is really the root of the problem. As a result, other criminals can be forgiven. In the absence of the rule of law and with a corrupt state, there is no difference between the legal and the illegal. 
Therefore, bringing the kidnappers and thieves before a court to be tried would only violate the element of respect in the detective's own theory of governance. What is interesting is that in the absence of the detective, the whole city descends into chaos. Uh, on two occasions, one in the mid, in the somewhere mid story, he leaves the city and then the city becomes chaotic. So criminals respect him very much and they um, avoid uh, committing crimes if he's there. And then when the novel ends, there is like a historical note explaining that uh, when he uh, uh, finally he left the city and he passed away somewhere else. So apparently the detective might have been a historical figure. And then again, the city uh, criminals came back. So this signifies the need for a strong individual to take control of the city and form a new model of governance. Interestingly, this actually happened with the establishment of the Pahlavi dynasty. So the first Pahlavi king, he was the strong individual who established order. The second instance, and um, this will be a shorter analysis, is this novel, uh, Elephant in Darkness. The retrospective narrative is once again providing ideological justification for the prospective estate. So this was published um, during the first year that the revolution happened in 1979. And in the narrative, a drug gang has hidden cocaine in a BMW, which an Iranian student living in Germany has brought has bought. So he, bought, he buys the car, but cocaine has been hidden somewhere in the car. He then drives the car all the way to Iran and is finally murdered due to a misunderstanding. So again, the gangs think he's, he's taken the cocaine, so he, they get rid of him. The core motivating force of the narrative, a bag of cocaine smuggled into Iran, is implausible. Nevertheless, in the whole process, the murder does not construct a mystery. There is a detective in the whole novel. There is a detective who is present, but only on the margins of the narrative as a constant nuisance to the protagonist. And the protagonist is the victim's brother, and he's a mechanic and runs a garage. In order to solve the mystery of the BMW, the many requests for its sale, so his gang members come and they offer to buy the BMW. The many offers to for its sale and his brother's murder, the mechanic does not rely on the state or state apparatuses. So he's exploring the case on his own. When trouble is looming, he takes refuge in religion. The individualizing, individualizing a social problem and marginalizing the state in the narrative are meant to signify the corruption of powerful gangs that undermine the state and social justice. Therefore, the necessity of establishing a new strong state. And this idea of the novel aligns with post-revolutionary Second Pahlavi era. The narrative is generally that the Second Pahlavi era was, was corrupt. So it's kind of, um, this novel is repeating that. In the third example, the figure of the detective is now a moral compass. Uh, in this instance too, which was broadcast in 1996, the story happens during the first Pahlavi era. So it is another retrospective narrative and it functions as ideological justification for the current post-revolutionary state. As in the Sheriff of Isfahan, the detective has multiple roles even though this time the separation of the legal and executive branches of the state is acknowledged. Now, there is a judiciary system. Uh, in episode three, a serial killer is arrested. Having figured out the criminal's motive for the murders, the detective tells his sidekick, I have talked to the judge to reduce her sentence. This is contradictory and inconsistent with the detective's own beliefs, because in episode six, he opposes the use of torture as the means to solve the mystery and argues we should all pursue the truth and nothing else. But this does not seem to apply to the truth of the serial killer's case, and the case is subjected to 
the irrational compassion of the detective through the judge uh, towards the, the uh, murderer. On the other hand, the leniency towards the murderer in this case implies that the victims of the serial killer were justifiably murdered because they were immoral characters. Uh, this is uh, part of the story. Uh, the serial killer is a woman and she's taking revenge because of her husband. Her husband uh, had a number of friends, but they were engaging in immoral activities. And then the husband confesses and repents uh, and, and, and leaves the gang, but um, then he's finally uh, killed by the gang. So he's, she's taking revenge. So then here, truth doesn't matter. Uh, morality is more important to this, the world of the, uh, the, the detective in this story. At the same time, the detective is accountable neither to the state nor the law. In episode eight, again, he tells us his sidekick, if I don't pursue the discovery of truth, I should feel guilty before God and my own conscience. And if I pursue truth, I must occasionally bear the brunt of punishment and the brunt of punishment by the state. So he is kind of putting himself above the state as far as moral concerns are concerned. The accountability of the detective to God is unverifiable. In other words, the individuation of crime and the legal process resists the state as the formative authority in social regulation. Being accountable to divine power signifies that the detective does not recognize the authority of the secular state he actually works for. So he's working for the state, but he doesn't recognize the state. To become recognizable, therefore, the state has to become legitimized by divine power. Hence, the essence of the post-revolutionary theocracy, the secular state, has no authority in front of the moral ethical detective. The relationship of the detective and the state with the law in this case is conditioned by expediency, not truth. And this is the opposite of what the detective claims. In episode three, the detective subjects the truth of the case of the serial killer to an irrational compassion and interferes in legal proceedings. In episode eight, he is asked to turn a blind eye on the involvement of a high-ranking officer uh, in the case he has handled. In other words, there is always constant demand to cover up someone's crimes. The legality of the law and the authority of the state and the fairness of the judiciary system are all open to negotiation and change in actual situations. So, the figure of the detective, the sheriff, the detective judge, functions against the complicit state. The state is itself the root perpetrator as the whole mystery is triggered by officials' corruption and incompetence. The second uh, detective, the observer, who represents the state, remains on the margins of and oblivious to the crime. He suspects something is up. He sees the BMW and he learns that everyone wants to buy it, but he never gets suspicious that maybe something is hidden. In it. So he, he just doesn't know. Uh, the detective is a formal element in this case without any function in the creation or solving of the crime. And finally, as an ethical figure, the detective, the third uh, figure, interferes in legal proceedings has contradictory and irrational attitudes to truth and law, which is justified by a self-righteous attitude backed by divine presence. So he thinks he's better than the secular state because he's ethical. The presentation of crime and violence has become more common as a narrative element in more recent Iranian films and series. These are only some of the examples. Uh, the display of violence on screen or on television is censored. If you write about violence, it will be censored. Uh, but these things are allowed to publish uh, violence. Are displayed bias 
brutal violence, but one of them in it. Similar uh, similarity to early British crime stories. Worthington argues that the display of the print on the gallows serves as, uh, serves as a conscience. I'm sorry. Um, so the, the moral voice. And finally, as an ethical figure, the detective interferes in legal proceedings, has contradictory and irrational attitudes to truth and law, which is justified by a self-righteous attitude backed by divine presence. So he thinks he's better than the uh, secular state because he uh, assumes that um, moral high ground. Now, uh, the presentation of crime and violence has become more common as a narrative element in more recent Iranian films. These are only uh, three samples. Uh, the presentation of crime, uh, the presentation of uh, violence on television or on a screen will be censored. Even if you write about it, it will be censored. Uh, but these films are given an opportunity to show uh, uh, violent scenes, uh, including uh, like honor killing um, or the execution of the criminal at the end of this, uh, the poster on the right side, Sheshonim is 6.5. Iranian films share a similarity with early British crime stories. Hera Worthington argues that the display of the criminal on the gallows serves an iconic function. And the function is that the individual criminal will be punished by the state. In other words, as mentioned before, crime and execution become reminders of the power of the state. For example, the violent display of an execution at the end of Metri Shishunim, just 6.5, is such a stark warning. And it takes around five to 10 minutes. Um, it's a lengthy process and uh, they let the viewer feel um, the fear that the character feels. Worthington, however, adds that in early British crime reports and stories, criminals' voices are silenced and their speech is rewritten. The criminal individuals become characters in a drama and pawns in the play of power, reduced to two-dimensional representations which efface individuality and subject it to a script which prescribes their speech. Now, Iranian films are different here in their use of crime and violence. First, criminals are exceptionally articulate for their social background. Most of them are uneducated or undereducated uh, from the slums, uh, but they are um, very well, they are very capable of expressing themselves. This is very weird as far as narrativity is concerned. Second, the role is displayed through muting the social and political background that cultivate the position of the criminal. Uh, Leticia mentioned uh, Bourdieu, and Bourdieu has this idea of uh, the creation of positions and position taking. So these individuals are actually taking a position because the position of the criminal is already there. They just feel the position. In an ahistorical and decontextualized display of crime, the criminal is cast as a marginal figure who is dangerous and yet controllable by an intervening uh, state. So the state will control them. Now this is subverting the subversive. In other words, whereas historically the absence of the state in Persian crime stories had been a critical element exposing the incompetence and corruption of the state, in more recent times, particularly after the revolution, uh, crime stories use the absence of the state in order to co-opt it in the service of the authoritarian state. In the absence of the state, crime develops to brutal levels, the display of which is actually sanctioned and not as expected censored. Criminals are portrayed to conceive of themselves above and beyond the law and the state must ultimately enter in order to reestablish order. The absence of the state is now a deliberate choice. And it says, this is what happens is society is left on its own. And this is a classic anti-liberal message 
uh, from the political establishment focused only on one thing, to justify the ways of the state, specifically capital punishment to people. And uh, in one of the films, there are actually psychologists who, in a kind of mock documentary narrative format, they take different positions and discuss the legality or um, the fairness of capital punishment. And finally, the person who says uh, these criminals must be punished like that, he wins the argument. Now, let me conclude by a few uh, conjectures on the conditions of genre circulation in world literature. Uh, Frederick Jameson argues that literary circulation happens through a combination of foreign form and local material. And Moretti proposes that there is foreign form, local material, and they create a new form. However, there is always the, problem, the question of formal failure, which happens when the transfer of the genre through translation does not lead to the reproductions of the genre. Each national context is located in the landscape of combined and uneven development. And as a result of that, the way states are formed, especially modern states and modern nation states, and the way that literature responds to that formation either by predicting it or by uh, reflecting on it or by retrospectively displaying it in order to justify something at the moment or in the future, it will change. Therefore, genre circulation does not only depend on formal transfer alone, which might be happening through translation or by uh, kind of imitations of the form, but requires other cultural factors. For example, author-reader agreement on the principles that regulate and govern the narrative. Uh, one case is the background assumptions about the state and law. And these background assumptions are rooted in um, normal expectations in the reality of the context. If you take a case to the judiciary, will it be taken seriously? Will truth matter or will they just throw the case away? Whether the state can be given symbolic authority, are authors are ready to give the symbolic authority to the state, or whether the judiciary system is fair and trustable, and whether the scientific means and methods of investigating crime are accessible and available, on the one hand, and plausible if used on the other. And there are a number of examples of that uh, in the cases that I mentioned. So these are factors that will have an impact on the formation and position of the genre and subsequently its reproduction and popularity. And as you can see, uh, to a large extent, this is sort of determined by the way the modern nation uh, state is formed and the position that Iran has had in the landscape of combined and uneven development. Thank you very much for your attention. I apologize again for the technical difficulty. I got disconnected. That's absolutely... Um... Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Omid. That was really tour de force, as they say. Uh, really uh, fascinating discussion on how, going back to the notion of world literature and the whole uh, predominant idea of the way genres travel um, from the north to the south and how they take a completely different life um, and it inhabits a different um, parameters and develop different aesthetics. In fact, they actually transform. And the case of the crime fiction here is a prime example of that. I would like to see that more uh, developed as, you know, that notion that when genres take um, travel to another context, they really uh, create different aesthetics and politics that are very much grounded within the context in which they live. And you showed us a perfect example there of crime fiction uh, in Iran. I, I was really fascinated by the three examples you offered us, the, 20, the 1925 one, um, uh, talking about the corruption of the state, then moving to elephants in darkness and talking about um, the preparation of the need for the divine right or that is inspiring the 79 revolution, then moving to the detective fiction um, which is, uh, uh, in a way, a different genre because it's TV drama, much more widely circulated, I guess, watched by millions of Iranians, uh, as the literary texts have um, 
a different circulation. I was wondering in terms of the literary prose, what happened then after the 1990s in terms of the literature one? Because you moved between the literary to the visual, um, yeah. which have a different forms of circulation. So I was wondering what happened then with the critique of the state when it has become inspired by the divine will, when it has that divine will, did the detective in the coming stories respect the state and did they still claim self-righteousness? So that's the first one. And the second one about the films. I find your analysis fascinating in the way you dealt with the questions of um, how um, the films are used in a way to um, bolster that notion of the state as the one that provides security to its citizens because criminals are evasive and guns are there and the state comes in to kind of control uh, the damage. So we need the state. That anti-liberal um, point that you highlighted in the sense that um, we need the re-established authority of the state. But didn't you read in these films gaps, you know, the unsaid, the untold, about actually the ineptitude of the state to offer security, the corruption um, of the state itself. Um, I mean, are they elements that were not said that you could read that were silent, but they are there because they couldn't all have supported that notion of the state, um, given, you know, the corrupt of part of the security apparatus in Iran. I was just thinking, and please forgive me, this is the last point, of the American uh, crime fiction, uh, particularly in the visual, in cinema, you know, the American blockbuster, we're all fed with this notion that, uh, you know, uh, make America great again. You know, the idea that although some aspects of American states are corrupt, there is always the good American who comes and save the world and save America. And then you get fed, well, although they are actually missing up the entire globe, there is always the good Americans there, that we believe in them. And that kind of bolstered that notion of the good American versus the corrupt one that always wins. So I was wondering how this dynamics works in, in, in the work that you've highlighted. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for, for your questions. Uh, what happened after 1990s to um, crime fiction in literature um, there, there, have, well, there, there is, for instance, now there are a number of publishers and they have book series. And one of the book series uh, is, is dedicated to crime fiction. And there is a limited number of crime stories uh, published. And there is this effort by a number of authors in order to create uh, the Sherlock Holmes of, of Iranian literary space uh, focused on characterization. But most of them... Uh, are either retrospective, uh, they focus on a previous time, not about the present moment, uh, and, uh, or if they are about the present moment, it's mostly about uh, the, the evil character uh, of the criminal. So it's focusing on the life of the criminal and how, for example, their childhood experiences contributed to that. Um, one, some, uh, one example is uh, most recently, there a series was made, uh, and this was based on a novel. Uh, and that novel was one kind of noir. And the social climber who kills people in order to achieve uh, his goals. And it was adapted for a series. After the adaptation, uh, people became aware of its existence and it sold a lot and its publication was banned and it was censored and republished. So these dynamics exist. Uh, but the significant thing uh, is that the focus of the use of the state uh, uh, is on popular media like television and cinema because of their influence. So that's where the state becomes, the authoritarian state uh, uses this crime fiction as a formula in order to constantly uh, re-justify and re-legitimize itself and for instance, talking about capital punishment. Uh, literature, unfortunately, because, it, because of censorship and because of strict controls, uh, it, it hasn't been able to improve much as a genre. Uh, Leticia also talks about uh, genre fiction in her work and the fact that uh, not just crime fiction, but also other genres, for instance, science fiction, have also not developed very much in modern Persian. So the, 
the development is not as you would expect it. So, and there are many reasons. Another reason is that the readership is very limited. Uh, reading is more or less like a higher class, highbrow thing, uh, whereas crime fiction would be middle middlebrow or lowbrow. So, uh, these are some of the factors that um, stop the development of the genre. Now, your question uh, is: There are other moments where these films become uh, kind of subversive. Um, I haven't noticed um, such moments in these films. And one reason is that uh, when you see a film is allowed to depict violent uh, moments, and there are lots of these violent moments from uh, like um, um, killing one sister, and it takes about three, four minutes, and you see a woman dying, and this is allowed, uh, which means that it has become a kind of ideological apparatus. Uh, and in non mainstream cinema or television production, there aren't many crime uh, stories used in order to reflect on that. Uh, but there are still a number of films that do this. Uh, they, instead of focusing on the crime itself, they focus on the bigger picture of how the ineptitude of the state is creating the conditions that finally lead to the committing of the crime or the conflicts that pushes someone to commit crime. But in mainstream culture, it's just like the American thing, but even it's worse than the American version. Because in America, there's a little bit of criticism, but it's still we're great. Uh, and the Iranian is the, the police or the detectives are always humanized, uh, like uh, in Metri Shishoni, 6.5. Um, the detectives, they are humans, they have troubles at home. Uh, there, someone is always on the phone calling them they can't really work with each other so this humanization of the detective is is giving the viewer the idea that look this is a just a no, this is just a normal person um, who is uh, handling the crime but the criminal is the abnormal person who has to be controlled and then executed and this is fair thank you so much thanks so we've got a few questions here um one by Enoch who I think you answered the first part of the question now the relationship between the state and the protagonists in the crime fiction um particularly uh, and the significances as a moral voice and perhaps a critic of the state I think you've addressed that but the second part of it is are they uh, readers in the Chinese speaking world of Iranian crime crime fiction um especially among students and staff in universities uh, in comparison in crime fiction writers like, um, and there are some few mentioned names uh, in China. Um, if you can answer that, I've got a few other ones here as well. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, in, in China, uh, Persian literature is, it's only classical Persian literature. Uh, so Persian literature is not known at all. Um, Persian as a language is not known. I have been to a number of conferences in comparative literature uh, and many colleagues, uh, they are kind of familiar with West Asia, Arabic and Turkish, but Persian is quite in the margin of the field of literary studies here. Um, those who do Persian, they do um, either classical Persian or uh, where like Persian as a Persianate, not in Iran, but let's say what was produced in Pakistan or India uh, and texts that are more interesting for them. Um, so unfortunately, no. There aren't many readers uh, of Persian crime fiction or even Persian modern fiction in China. Talking of circulation, thank you. The second question by Michelle is about um, uh, the second case study of the 1960 TV series. The critique that you've discussed on the Pahlavi uh, period, is it an attempt to, le to de legitimize the legal standing of the Pahlavi rule? And that this somehow legitimized the failure of detective to apply the letter of the law in favor of applying his own moral ruling to the cases. Um, I, I think many of the films, uh, especially whatever produced for television after the revolution, they were always focused on showing how corrupt the Pahlavi state was uh, for various reasons. And uh, this is, um, uh, the, the series is very complicated in the sense that it's constantly drawing and redrawing the boundaries of the nation. Uh, for instance, the Russian, the American, and the British people uh, are always criminals. The French and the Germans are not, right? It, it's, it's very black and white in that sense. Uh, um, but, and this is the point, um, 
by this retrospective narrative, placing the detective at the beginning of the first Pahlavi era, it shows that there were like these voices of society who were protecting society. And at the end of the series, the detective loses his job. So he's dismissed because he sticks to the truth. And this truth is what he's uh, responsible for as far as God is concerned. Uh, and this becomes the person who forms the new uh, state in, uh, after, the, after 1979. Um, so yeah, it's uh, probably functioning like that to delegitimize the Pahlavi state. The second series of, uh, of Detective Alavi is about the second Pahlavi era. It wasn't as successful because the stories become kind of uh, like Hollywood detective fiction, um, but it functions in the same way. Thank you, Omid. Um, third question here is from Banafshi. She's um, he's asking about, or they are asking about, um, uh, are there any documented detective or crime material or book before uh, the book you mentioned, The Sharif of Asfahan, and how this genre was expressed in Iranian old literature? Um, if we think of detective fiction the way it's defined in Europe, that a crime happens and it's a mystery and then it will be solved by the use of scientific methods, uh, I, I haven't come across any examples in uh, pre-modern Persian literature in which someone takes the role of solving the crime. Uh, there are lots of examples of crime, and that's a fascinating thing because crimes are dealt with in many different ways. Uh, they are never the same. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I'm not familiar with any. Um, and it would be interesting if there is a crime writer uh, before a modern period, because then it would change the history of crime fiction, which is thought to have started in the middle of the 19th century by the writings of uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Omid. Uh, Leticia has her hand up. Could you please? Um... Yeah, no, just wondering, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, just wondered. I couldn't my type in the one. chat, so I'm just, I'm just asking the question to you, Omid. Can you talk a bit about the dynamics in contemporary Iran between translations of crime fiction and crime fictions in Persian? And are translations mostly from Western languages, or is there anything coming from, I don't know, Arabic, Japanese, Chinese? Can you talk a bit about the translation? Okay, um, if, uh, if by translation you mean that someone translates it into Persian and then publishes it, uh, in that sense, uh, nearly all translation comes from European languages, uh, uh, primarily English, British, and American crime fiction. Um, but um, crime fiction has a small market, as far as I have seen. Uh, uh, and it's not like uh, one example is... Um, uh, John Le Carré, the British writer. Uh, so he published a novel in 1963. It was adapted for uh, cinema a year later, but he wasn't, uh, this book wasn't published and uh, translated into Persian for uh, four or five decades. It was translated when he achieved this canonical status. So when he had a status, then it was. So the genre itself has been marginal. Uh, on the other hand, if by translation we mean it's the, uh, these crime stories are received in Iran, uh, perhaps in foreign languages, yes, there, are, uh, there is a lot of interest uh, in various forms of crime, uh, but it's either by films that are dubbed into, uh, that are with subtitles, or people who read um, in French or English or German. Uh, there isn't much from uh, Asian uh, literatures in contemporary trans, uh, contemporary literary field. So the majority are from uh, from the U.S. primarily. Thank you, thank you, everyone. I think that was the last question. Unless anyone has a burning question, I can allow that. Um, otherwise, I would like to set, to thank sincerely Professor Omid. Azadi Buga, that was an excellent um, presentation. And thank you so much for the gener generosity of ideas and times. And thank you, everyone. I think we are now having a break, a lunch break, and then we will reconvene uh, at one o'clock. Uh, Zara, is it? Um, I'm just going to check my program again. I think um, we are convening at. Um, 1 p.m. Yes, 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 1 p.m. Yes, 1 p.m. Thank you, everyone. This has been a fantastic start.
Uh, thank you all very much. We'll see you at 1 p.m. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.